Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to have everybody back. I guess you've had your break and you've had your cup of coffee. And uh, for those of us uh, on television, we just pray now that you would be able to take your Bible and as most of you write constantly, that you take your notes, you study with us, and that you have learned how to study on your own. And that's all we ask. We don't want people to say, well, this is what Les Feldick says, but study the Word so that you can say, this is what the book says, because that's the only thing that counts. And again, we thank all of you out there in television for your response, your letters, your offerings, everything, and uh, your prayers. My, we couldn't go a day without all of that. And again, for those of you here in the audience, we uh, in the studio, we appreciate your coming in. This would not be very interesting as even when we first started, you know, we look at some of our, our old tapes as we're dubbing them yet, and uh, if we had 12 or 14 over there in the old studio, we thought we were pretty fortunate. But uh, it is. It's so rewarding to see all of you here every, every month now. Okay, we're going to pick right up where we left off in the next part of book number 64. This will be the second half hour. And uh, we're going to go back now to the next covenant on the board, which is the new covenant. Now, if you remember, uh, those of you with, with me from the very beginning, that seven is always the number of completion. And then the eight is the number of new beginnings. We see that over and over in Scripture. And now we've come through the seven covenants, and we're going to look now this afternoon at the eighth covenant, which will jump all the way into the kingdom. The new covenant will not become a reality for Israel until they have the king and the kingdom. And then we're going to show what is our relationship with this new covenant. Because I maintain that we as members of the body of Christ are not covenant people. We are not under the covenant per se. We merely are enjoying all the ramifications of what God did to fulfill the new covenant. All right, now turn with me then, if you will, to Jeremiah <coughs> chapter 31. And we're going to jump in at verse 31. Again, this is a series of verses that we use a lot. Jeremiah 31, 31. And again, I beg people, just read what it says. Not what someone has told you they think it says, but what does it really say? All right, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. Now, this is the word of God. I will make a new covenant with the house of of Israel. Can you make that any plainer? I don't see how you can. It doesn't say with a whole race. It doesn't say with a whole world. He's making a new covenant with Israel. And Israel means Israel. All right, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. That was at a time when the kingdom was split, remember. Now verse 32 not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they broke. And although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Now what covenant did they break? Law. My, they broke it over and over and over and over. And yet God never gave up on them. And so the whole concept is now that under this new covenant, they won't be breaking it. They won't be tempted to rebel. They will not be disobedient because they're going to be in a heaven on earth environment. Satan is locked up and there will be no temptations to disobey. But on top of that, the result of the new covenant on the Jewish individual will be so domineering that they won't have to worry about breaking anything. And we'll see that in just a minute. All right, let's go on. Verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will. That's future. Hasn't happened yet, but we think we're getting close. That when Christ returns and sets up his kingdom, then this covenant will become an everyday reality. 
All right. So he says, This covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put the law not on frontlets on their forehead, not on their doorposts, but where? In their heart. He will write it on their heart, see? And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now tonight, yes, Israel is still under God's covenant promises. He's watching over them, but they're not his people today. They're anything but. They're secular. They're in unbelief for the most part. Not all, but for the most part. And they are not his people. As he spoke to Moses, they're your people. Remember? And Moses said, no, God, I don't want them. They're your people. Well, you see, it was because of their rank disobedience. But that's all going to end. All right, read on. Verse 34. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor. In other words, they're not going to have to sit down and constantly be studying the Torah like yeshiva students do today. They won't have to study and try to figure out what is this verb. They'll have full understanding because it will be written in their hearts. All right, reading on in verse 34. And every man his brother saying, Know the Lord. Why? For they shall all know me. See? It isn't like today where we have to be concerned about a lost loved one or a lost neighbor. And Israel was no different or is no different. My, the Jews for Jesus people are constantly handing out tracts and trying to win lost Jews. Well, That'll no longer be necessary. Every Jew in the kingdom will be a dyed-in-the-wool, heart-made believer. All right? Verse 34, reading on. They shall all know me from the least of them, and the greatest, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. They are going to be in total relationship with their Jehovah God, who will then, of course, be also their King and their Messiah and the Redeemer. Now, we've used these last three, four verses so often, I'm not going to take time now today, but these next verses are another guarantee that nothing, nothing will ever remove Israel from the scene. They are here and will be forever. My, when we were there a few weeks ago and we see all those four-lane highways, wasn't it amazing, Ike? I mean, just like any other great city and bustling. My, you can't imagine the activity in Israel. And uh, it's just all because God's promises are coming to the fore. All right, now let's just jump over to chapter 32 for just a second, where the prophet repeats it, basically. So we won't spend a lot of time on these verses. But drop over to chapter 32, verse 37, honey. Verse 37, and that's what we've seen happening now these last 50 years. Right in front of our eyes, we've seen it happen. Behold, God says, I will gather them out of all countries. Now, who can refute that? My, they've been coming from all over the world into their ancient homeland. Whether I have driven them in mine anger, in other words, it was a chastising act of God that took them out of the land after the crucifixion in 70 A.D. and scattered them into every nation under heaven. Remember, we looked at the promises and the prophecies a while back in Deuteronomy. Way back at the time of Moses, he wrote that they would be scattered into every nation under heaven and God would bring them back. All right, here Jeremiah is prophesying the same thing. I will bring them again, verse 37. I will bring them again into this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. Now, they're not dwelling safely yet, but they're, a lot of them are already there. Now, verse 38, this hasn't happened yet. It's all waiting for the return of Christ. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And again, verse 39, I will give them one heart and one way and they may fear or respect or reverence me forever for the good of them as well as their children after them. And now verse 40, and I will make a what? An everlasting covenant. 
God will never let go of the nation of Israel. And once this kingdom economy comes in, it's going to feed right up into eternity. And they will forever be then his covenant people. All right, now I'm going to take you back to show you the difference between having these things written in their heart and the way Moses left it in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now I just like to show the comparison that they, even as God's covenant people in history, have never come close to the promises of the new covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And since we're so close to it, I'm going to read verse 4. Because this is what the Jew, even today, if he has any semblance of biblical belief at all, he will hang on this verse. And of course, this is where they have an argument with us with a triune God. And they say there is only one God. Well, what they don't comprehend is that it's three persons in one. But they go back to this verse, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, with all thy might. All right, now verse 6. This was the everyday condition of even the believing Jew in Moses' day. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Now watch it. This isn't mentioned in the New Covenant and thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and I sh they shall be as frontlets between thy eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Why? To be constantly reminded of what the Word of God is saying. But see, when you come under the New Covenant, that won't be necessary. It'll be on their heart. They won't have to read it and remind themselves and talk to their neighbor about it. It's going to be as automatic as daylight following dark. Now, that's the vast difference then between the New Covenant and the Mosaic or the Old Covenant. All right, now let's jump all the way up to the New Testament because that's what we like to do is not just stay in the old, but compare it also with things in the new. Come up with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. And I'll have to look a minute, honey, to see what verse I want. Chapter 8, verse 6. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. And I'm convinced that Paul is the writer of this letter to the Hebrews. But on the other hand, always remember, who is he writing to? He's writing to Jews, see? All right, verse 6. But now. Now, this is what I'm hoping we'll cover in our next few tapings, are the but nows in Scripture. Here's one of them. But now, that is, after this work of the cross has been accomplished, but now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Now that's one of Paul's favorite words throughout the letter of Hebrews, better. Now verse 7, For if the first covenant, the covenant of law, the Ten Commandments, and the, the temple worship and the priesthood, if that first covenant had been faultless, or if it had been perfect, then there should be no place for the second, naturally. If something is okay, you don't fix it. What's our little cliche? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, it's the same context here. If the first covenant of law had been perfect, there'd be no need for a new one. But it wasn't, see? It was full of weaknesses, and we'll see it in just a minute. All right? Verse 8, for finding fault with them, its imperfections. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. See, now this is back before even Jeremiah uh, mentions it. And this is where Paul is going back 
2. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now he's quoting from Jeremiah 31, which we just read. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day and took them by the hand and so on and so forth. Now verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Now it has nothing to say about the Gentile world. This is strictly God dealing with the house of David, the house of Israel. Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, and I will put my laws into their mind, I will be to them a God, and they shall be my people. They won't have to do like Moses said, teach every man his neighbor, and so on and so forth. Now verse down 13. In that he saith a new covenant. He has made the first one what? old, worn out. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Why? Because it's no longer of any use. It's worn out. All right, now let's back up a little bit and pick up a couple contexts. Galatians chapter 4. Because I think a lot of people think that the law was perfect. Well, that's fine if you think so. The Ten Commandments certainly are perfect. There's nothing amiss in any of those, but still the whole function of law did not change anybody's heart. They could be a law keeper and still be as lost as lost can be. All right, Galatians chapter 4, now verse 9. Galatians 4, verse 9. But now, see, there's another one. Oh, I got all kinds of them. But now, after you have known God, in other words, come into a real salvation experience based, of course, now on Paul's gospel of the work of the cross. But now, after you've known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. Well, now what's Paul saying? When you've got something so perfect as the gospel that was according to the death, burial, and resurrection, brings in new life, why do you want to go back to something that's less than perfect, which was the sacrificial <laughs> system of the law? All right, let's back up a little further. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 3, 2 Corinthians, chapter 3. Almost have to read verse 5 in order to understand verse 6. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5. Not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Without Him, we're nothing. <clears throat> All right, now verse 6. <clears throat> this same God, the same God who has saved us now through our faith in the gospel, has also made us able ministers of a new testament or covenant, not of the letter, which is Paul's term for the law, but of the Spirit, because now the very core of our, of our life the very core of our salvation has been brought about by the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And here's the reason. The letter, the law, doesn't give life. It what? It kills. The law could never give life to anybody. Never did and doesn't now and never will. All the law could do was show a man his sin. And most of Christendom hasn't got it yet today. That's all the law can do is show our sin. There's no life in the law. But when we turn away from the law after being convicted by it, what does give life? The Holy Spirit. And so now in this age of grace, and Israel will experience it in the kingdom, now when the Holy Spirit imparts eternal life, it's not based on the law, it's based on the work of the cross. Because the law, now read the next verse, verse 7. But the law was 
the ministration of death. Oh, people don't like that. That's not what they've always heard. But that's all the law could do. The law killed. Why? Because it condemned. And if a person was condemned, what was the punishment? Eternal doom. And this consequently it became a ministration of life. Nobody could be saved by keeping the law. Even in Israel's history, the law didn't save them. It was their faith in carrying out what God said to do as a lawbreaker, but it never saved them. And this is what we have to understand, that even today, you know, when they make all this commotion about the Ten Commandments, well and good, but the Ten Commandments never saved anybody. All they do is convict. All right? And so here it is. The ministration of death, verse 7, written and engraven in stone was glorious, Paul says, but now it's been done away with because of the cross. So even though it was glorious that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, that is, when he had been in the presence of God and received the tables of stone. But that glory is to be what? Done away. Why? Because like Hebrews said, when something grows old and it's worn out, what do you do with it? You cast it away. Okay, so now in the following six minutes, we have to clarify, if we're not under the new covenant, then what is the basis for our salvation today under grace? Well, to put it in a nutshell, the new covenant itself could never become a reality until God the Son went the way of the cross. It had to be even for Israel. Now, that's one thing I want to clarify. In order for the new covenant to become a reality written on the heart of a Jew during the kingdom, it had to be based on that eternal sacrifice, that shed blood that was accomplished there on the cross of Calvary. But through his power of resurrection and imparting new life, in order to fulfill the covenant promise made to Israel, he now, as, as I call it, a splashover. We're not under the direct covenant promise, but we are enjoying everything that was done on Israel's behalf now becomes applicable for us. So consequently, how do we attain eternal life? By believing that this Messiah, Redeemer, and this Son of God that presented himself to Israel, who was rejected, crucified, and raised the dead, now becomes our salvation. By believing that plus nothing. And even though we're not under the covenant, we are enjoying all the excesses of it before Israel even comes into the picture. All right, now let's just pick up a few verses that will, I think, bring this to the fore. Come back with me again to Romans. Romans chapter 3. Now this is where we come in to what work of the cross that was accomplished according to the eternal promises and covenants with Israel, but now God extends it to us as Gentiles who are not members of the nation of Israel. We are not in Israel covenant promises, but we are under God's grace. And we are now partaking of that which was given to the nation of Israel. All right, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. That all-encompassing statement that covers every human being regardless of station in life. And that is that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a one of us that can claim not to have sinned. We are all condemned by God's perfect law. All right? But God doesn't leave it there. Verse 24. Being justified freely, not by his covenant promises, but by what? Grace. See? We are now justified freely by his grace. And how does that grace flow from God to us? Through the price of redemption that was paid for in Christ Jesus. And who has now required us to have, verse 25, have faith in his blood, that is, his shed blood, 
which is the cleansing factor. It's the redemption price. And to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now verse 26. My, what a promise. And again, most people evidently don't read this verse or they don't know it's here, but it's plain as day. To declare, Paul says, I say at this time, his righteousness, not ours. We don't attain to anything. We don't deserve anything. But it's because of his righteousness that he, Christ, or God, might be just. He's never going to cut corners with anybody. He's going to be just, and he will be the justifier of him or of that person who what? Who believes. See, and this is where so much of Christendom is ignoring the fact that according to the Apostle Paul, salvation doesn't come by walking an aisle. It doesn't come by taking Jesus into your life and heart. It comes by believing. <coughs> and I'm hoping that God is going to bend his thinking enough to save these people that are think they're being saved. But I'll tell you what, it's beginning to shake me up. If the book says that we're saved by faith, by believing, and they ignore that, I've got questions. I'm in no place to judge, naturally. But here is the whole emphasis in Paul's epistles that salvation comes by believing. Believing what? All right, 1 Corinthians 15, and then I guess our time is gone. And then I sweat all night wondering how I'm going to fill 30 minutes. I never learn. 1 Corinthians 15, first four verses. My, we should know them from memory by now, shouldn't we? 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. There's only one. Verse 2, by which you are saved. See, it's this gospel that saves, nothing else. And here it is. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It was foretold. And he was buried, and he arose again the third day according to the scripture. That's the gospel. And you don't receive the gospel by just simply saying, I want Jesus in my heart. No, you believe the gospel. Thank you for watching the Through the Bible with Les Spelding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.